Let us not forget everything that happens. It's by the will of Allah. Holy it's time to unite and stand, and we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or duty unthinkable, but to stand together as one. Turn into sooner followers, streaming. Every day, various platforms, trust me, you'll find a way, soon the followers, you will make it through, the fifth is awakening you. With Quran and Sunnah by your side is a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. You will make it through. The fitra is awakening you. With Quran and Sunnah on your side is a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. With Quran and Sunnah on his side, here's a place where it will thrive. You will make it through. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Alhamdulillah, I want to welcome everybody back to the second day after Ramadan. Hello, mashallah. You guys know yesterday I was kind of under the weather. And the way I was under the weather was literally under it. You know, I was sleepy. Ramadan's taken so much of a toll on me but by my uh, changing my nights and days and doing all the programming and all of that, switching the schedule around to accommodate the break of the fast. So a lot of people sent me some emails asking me what happened to my class. I'm sorry, I fell asleep yesterday. I didn't do the nine o'clock class. I passed out and that was done. I slept for 12 hours. Literally, I went to sleep at nine o'clock, didn't wake up until 10 o'clock this morning, which I needed that because it put me back on track, back on daylight time instead of vampire time, you know. And uh, mashallah, you know, I got a lot of stuff done today. Uh, first of all, I want you guys to know I did the schedule. I want everybody to remember we are back to our regular program scheduling. We're back to six o'clock for this class and uh, nine o'clock for the other class. We're no longer doing 11, thank God. We're back to 9 p.m. Also, Brother Mukhtar. Mukhtar will resume his class on the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Sunday. His class will be Sundays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I added that to the schedule. If you go to the Sunnah Followers, um, the SunnahFollowers.net, that's our website. Go to SunnahFollowers.net and click on Schedule. You will see all of our uh, uh, the schedules for the classes. I updated it for the rest of the month. Uh, so make sure you guys go to SunnahFollowers.net for the schedule. It's on our, you know, of all the classes, right? I, I'm waiting for Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, you know, he's a real doctor. He's probably in the hospital. I'm waiting on him to return um, to text me with his classes. You know, he has his Saturday class. Does that resume this week, guys? He said the week of the 20th. No, next week. Dr. Ali's classes will resume next week, inshallah, on the 20th. Next week, next Saturday, he will resume his class. And also, Dr. Ali does a um, some classes for the new shahadas. And since I have a lot of new, uh, new converts since Ramadan, I uh, want y'all to stick around because Dr. Ali will be, I will stream his classes too uh, for the new converts. And also I'm waiting on Dr. Dramali. Dramali's supposed to send me his schedule plus Sheikh Saud. Remember Sheikh Saud? He's the uh, uh, the scholar from uh, the Islamic jurist from off of Amja. Okay, he's one of the scholars from Amja. 
uh, also his classes. So I'll put, you know, plug in everybody else's classes as they send them to me. But to let you guys know, my class is already happening. Six o'clock, nine o'clock. Mukhtar will be Sunday at seven. Okay. So I just want to update y'all on the schedule. And speaking about Mukhtar, for all of my Sunnah follower sisters uh, who uh, sent their um, zakat and if uh, their zakat will fit her to the Muslims in Ghana, uh, Mukhtar said, never have these brothers and sisters ever experienced that. You know, and this is what I was talking about. You know, we get so caught up letting the Zionists put our focus on just one part of the world, which is the Arabic part, that we forget our Muslim brothers and sisters in Africa. Like I told you, there's more Muslims in Africa than there are in the Middle East, okay? But we never pay attention to what's happening to the Muslims in Africa. They've been faced with genocide for decades. This genocide didn't just begin with Gaza. I hope y'all know that. They've been trying to get rid of all the Muslims in Africa for decades. What's going on in the Sudan has been happening for a long time. Also what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in the Congo, what's happening in Ghana, in Nigeria, Africa. They've been trying to annihilate, annihilate the Muslims in Africa for decades, but nobody seems to care about them because they're black, they're African. Well, subhanAllah, I put a bunch of shorts out. There's a couple of shorts of mine that's out there in the internet about how we should not ignore the cries of our brothers and sisters in Africa. We should not ignore them and say, let them eat mud because that's what some of these Muslims are saying on TikTok. Oh, who cares about them? Let them eat mud. All we care about is Gaza. That's not Islam. You know, when one of us hurts, all of us feel it. So alhamdulillah here at Sunnah followers uh, for the those Muslims in Ghana who don't even have a tent. By the way, they don't even have a tent to live in. These people live in Bomas. Y'all know what a Boma is? How many of you watch Naked and Afraid? How many of you watch the TV show Survivor? A Boma is just a place on the ground where you take some and puts you from the rain and, and, and sun. That's what these people in Africa, that's what these people in Africa are living in. They don't even have the luxury of having a tent. They share their water with the hippopotamus and the animals in the, uh, the, that, that in the river. They boil their water. They bathe in the river with the hippopotamus and all of that. So, you know, these people didn't have the luxury. They've never had the luxury of having a home to be destroyed because nobody ever cared to help them build a home. They never had running water. But alhamdulillah, I just want to share because that's what the here at Sunnah followers, uh, a lot of the sisters here sent their zakat fitter, you know, to help the Muslims over there. And uh, the ransom, the ransom for the fasting went to help the Muslims in Ghana and Tanzania. And we also had some from Mali and Niger. And Mukhtar wanted to let me uh, share with you guys that the brother called today that y'all see in the videos that's delivering the food. They also send the video showing, you know, where your money was going because they showed you killing the cow. They showed you cooking the food. They showed you delivering the food to the people who don't even have a house or a tent. They lying on the dirt. You see the smiles on those people's faces. Well, Mukhtar wanted me to share with all you sisters that the brother called today and said this has never, ever happened in their life. They've never had anyone care about their village. Alhamdulillah, you sisters here at Sunnah followers, you fed two villages worth of people. Over five, 600 people y'all fed with your Zakat the fitter and gave them hope. 
because as the brother told Mukhtar, they've never, ever, ever had any Muslims to care about them like this. So I just wanna let you sisters know what a good deed you've done. And also guess what, Sunnah followers? Inshallah, they don't have to bathe with the hippopotamus no more. Inshallah, they don't have to eat mud as the TikToker said. Alhamdulillah, thanks to two of the students who sent the cash, they're building two wells, not one well, but two wells. So these villagers will have water, fresh, clean water, and they're getting an electric pump, not the kind that you do with the hand. Thanks to your donations, you sisters, the two sisters paid for them to have real wells with the electric pump so they don't have to drink and bathe with the hippopotamus no more, okay? So alhamdulillah, this is a good deed, you know, that Sunnah followers did, you know, I'm so proud of all of my, my students here for pulling together and taking care of these two villages worth of Muslims who this seems like the rest of the world ignore. And by the way, they lost their homes too, not by bombs. But for those of you who don't know, you want to know what the Zionists have been doing to the Africans for the past 10 years or more? They've been bulldozing their little huts down. They don't drop bombs on them. They bring in the bulldoze, just roll them over and kill them in the process too. If you in the house, they don't care. They're going to roll you over, kill you, kill your babies. So this genocide is not new. It's just that the Zionists want you Muslims to focus on one part of the world while they're destroying the other part. Like I told you before, you know, the Middle East, the Gulf has the oil. The Gulf states have the oil. Africa has the natural gas, the diamonds, the rubies, and the minerals. The Zionists have a plan conquer, divide and conquer. And you people are sucked up into their scheme. Well, while the rest of the world is focusing on Gaza, alhamdulillah, Sunnah followers, we're focusing on Africa to try to make a difference there that nobody else seems to care about. And like I tell you guys, take those flags off. Islam, we don't wear flags. I put the Dalil out. What's the banner? The banner of Islam is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah. The banner of Islam is not the flag of Gaza. Okay? Because there are millions of Muslims going through the same genocide in different ways. Okay? We're one nation. Y'all understand that? Y'all better get it together as Muslims. Stop giving these Zionist power over us. Remember, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, our destruction will never come from our enemies. Our destruction will come from ourselves. We will divide, we will separate, we will oppress, kill each other. We will become racist. We'll revert back to tribalism. We'll revert back to racism and destroy each other. And that's what's happening. We're being racist. It's all about the Arabic world. It ain't about Africa. When I saw those TikToks, those TikTok videos, and by the way, let me just share to everybody. My TikTok account got banned. Did y'all see that? They banned me on TikTok. Y'all see that? Layla Nasheba, Google it on TikTok. They banned my account. Why? Because I'm speaking out. Okay? Those TikTok videos of Muslims saying that the people of Africa can eat mud. Well, my account's been banned because I said we're one nation. I've been speaking out against those flags and against this eat mud. They banned my TikTok account. Oh yeah, Layla's banned off of TikTok. 
But guess what? I never used it anyway. My students put me on TikTok. I don't care about no TikTok. They don't do nothing for me. Okay. But I'm banned. Don't offer TikTok. Y'all see that? Layla's banned. They told me your account has been removed. So this is what the Zionists want, that separatism. They want the Muslims to focus on Gaza while they're destroying the heck out of Africa, the motherland. All right. All right. So anyway, Alhamdulillah. For the sisters here at Sunnah followers, and may Allah accept all of our uh, our charity, our zakat. May Allah accept our fast. May Allah accept uh, forg uh, forgive us of all our sins. I mean, I mean, and life goes on. Sarah, Sarah, say la vie, whatever. Okay, and we're continuing in this class our discussion on how to maintain our Muslim identity without allowing the Zionists to divide and conquer us. How to maintain that true Islamic identity that's based on having allegiance to Allah, allegiance to the Prophet وسلم, and allegiance to each other, regardless of what country you from, what flag a person claims to love. First of all, you should love Allah and I love the Prophet وسلم, and love yourself and your brothers and sisters in Islam. Ain't about no flag. Why do y'all think we don't pledge allegiance? I remember guys, see, I grew up in the sixties. I've been Muslim all my life, okay? Born and raised in the USA. The 60s was a terrible time in American history. It was the civil rights period. Malcolm X, Malcolm X, uh, 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 after he made Hajj, he discovered the true Islam, which is based on la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dor Rasulullah, not la ilaha illallah, Elijah Muhammad Dor Rasulullah. When Malcolm X brought the real Islam here to America and made it public, he became enemy number one. That's when Islam became, we got to take them out. We don't want that true Islam here. We rather deal with Elijah Muhammad because anybody with common sense can see through his ludicrousy, okay? When I grew up in the 60s, let me tell you all about it. I remember when I was in the first grade, or was it the third? No, it was the third. I was in the third grade. That's when the teacher wanted us to stand up and pledge allegiance to a flag. I remember I was in the third grade. I remember my teacher's name. Her name was Mrs. Weathers, Miss Weathers, Miss Weathers. She was so hard on me because I was different than the other girls. I looked different, dressed different, and behaved differently. And I was a genius, A1 student, super genius. They did, they diagnosed, they tested me, this girl's a genius, off the charts, okay? I remember she tried to make me stand up and pledge allegiance. I'll never forget it. I went home that day and I told mom, I said, mom, Miss Weathers made me stand up and pledge allegiance. My mother said, what? I'll never, ever in my life forget it. My mother dressed in all black. Now, at my mom's, me and Mukhtar's mom's, we were with Darla Slime. It was Darla Slime back then. Darla Slime were with the Malcolm X's. I'll never forget when you see them Darla Slime dress up in black, that means business. My mother put on her black abaya. She had on a hijab, that her black hijab that came down to the ground. Her and my godmother named Sister Kalima. I'll never forget that next morning, my mother and Sister Kalima, they walked up to that school and my mother told Miss Weather, she said, I wanna talk to you in the principal's office. And my mother told him, my daughter is Muslim. She says she believes la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dora Rasulullah. 
And wallahi, my mother told them, y'all are not going to do to her what you did to Malcolm X. She said, you ain't going to do to my daughter what you did to Malcolm. She don't pledge allegiance to no country. She pledges allegiance to Allah alone. She said, and if y'all ever make my daughter pledge allegiance to a flag, she said, we will have this school surrounded with the black nationalists, the black panthers, and the Muslims. We'll surround it. Wasn't no pledge of allegiance no more. I never had to pledge allegiance. And it wasn't just me back in those days. Muslims fought hard. Do you guys know that we Muslims in America fought hard to get the schools to accept the fact that our allegiance is not to a flag, that our allegiance is to Allah? How does that make us look now? Here, I was in the third grade. That means I was what, eight years old? I am 62 years old now. So here, 50 something years later, we've reverted back to how it used to be. Now you got Muslims pledging allegiance to flags of Palestine. Can y'all believe that? When people like my mother, People like Malcolm X, let me just keep it real. Malcolm X fought against that. Malcolm X, yeah, my stepfather and Mukhtar's and them father, they were with Malcolm X. They fought against that stuff. All the rights that Malcolm X and other Muslims fought to establish for us, y'all doing away with it? We back now, so now how's that gonna look? You send a Muslim kid to American public schools and you say, uh, and you say we don't pledge allegiance to a flag. They're going to ask you, then why do you got Palestine around your neck? Why is your child dressed in Palestinian flags? Do y'all see the hypocrisy? Do y'all see the hypocrisy in that? Every time we deviate away from the Quran and the authentic Sunnah, it ends up in chaos. So what Malcolm X fought against, what my stepfather fought against, what my mother fought against, what Mukhtar's father fought against, what Imam Latif fought against, what Imam Siraj fought against, what Khalid Yassin, oh, they were all together, what Hakim Quick, all that they fought against, y'all done brought it back because you can't accept the Qatar of Allah? You back to worshiping flags? Sad, you Muslims got it twisted. Oh yeah, I'm not no young girl. I keep telling you guys, I may look like I'm 20. I'm an old woman. I've been around longer than all these brothers on the scene who don't know nothing. Subhana Allah, it's really sad guys. We have to get back to living the identity of the Muslim, not the identity of a culture, not the identity of a race, not the identity of a cartoon character. We got to learn to emulate the way of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not the way of anyone or anything else. And by the way, there is no one on this planet today, not in Africa, not in Gaza, who's been through more than the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent his whole mission fighting. Muslims were killed, genocided, annihilated. But they still believed la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dur Rasulullah, and they were together. They were together. They were not separate based on tribe or race or color or part of the world. Get it together, Muslims. SubhanAllah. Yeah, I thought about that today. I said my mother went up to that school, threatened to have the whole school surrounded with the black nationalists, black panthers, and the Muslims because they made me pledge allegiance to a flag. And here we got Muslims wearing flags, making us look stupid. Sad. All right, so let's get to the topic today. How can we keep the Muslim identity? 
while living in a, 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 a an environment or a society, a society that's that's not based on the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, I want you guys to get your uh, uh, the big screen on for the kids. And by the way, the children's class will resume. Yes, this um, this um, uh, Sunday. And I'll be teaching from the book written by Brother um, Abdullah Kirk on called Dunya. Everybody should have that book. I want the children to go over the first chapter. So the parents, I want you to review the first chapter of the book. And I'm going to put a memo out. Write that down. Geechee. Fame, write yes. it. Yeah, write it down for me after this, to get the uh, memo. That make yep. a thing up about the, letting the parents know the, that you know about the kids' class for uh, Sunday. Yeah, the okay. yeah, y'all do the first chapter with the children, and there's questions at the back of at the end of the chapter. At the end of the chapter, there are some review questions. Go over those review questions with the children, because I will have the quiz. We're going to go over that chapter and I'll have that quiz for them. So children, get that book. I'm sure you got it now. Dunya, first chapter. You got today, tomorrow, and Saturday to review it with your moms. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Hold on here. Yeah, learning. You got to keep it going. Lil Ibrahim says, Sister Layla, I love your classes. I love coming here. Mashallah. Let me know if anybody acts crazy on Twitch. He's on Twitch. And um, I've been getting some crazy people on Twitch lately. Let me know. We'll log in and ban them if they act crazy on there today. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Okay. Give me a second. I'm going to do the Zoom people first. Yeah. Okay. Here. This is it. Yeah. Okay. This is people here. Hold on. That's the PowerPoint for you all. People on YouTube. Here I come with the PowerPoint for everybody. And please, guys, take screenshots for the children. And what I want you guys, and this also for yourselves too. At the end of the class, I want you guys to print out. Everybody should print out the screenshots. Print out uh, your screenshots and uh, staple them together, and you want to attach them to pages uh, 131 of your book. Because we're covering pages 131 through 134 tonight. Oh, wait a minute. 131 through 134. And we're going to speak about actions that we should avoid because they'll take us away from Allah. And we talked about this briefly uh, when we were fasting during Ramadan. We talked about how as Muslims, we should try to engage in actions that bring us close to Allah. So let's take a look at tonight's episode, what we're going to be speaking about. And there will be a quiz, so pay attention. For all of you listening, I will be giving you a quiz after this, this class. So pay attention. Okay. One of the significant means to bring Allah's love into our life and also into our hearts, as we talked about during Ramadan, and many of you did this, that's by participating, participating in gatherings with sincere people who love Allah. We call them gatherings of remembrance. You guys did this during Ramadan when you went to the mosque for the Tarawee prayer, coming to my classes here. These type of gatherings provide an invaluable opportunity to benefit because you listen to the words of the people and their wisdom. You learn from the wisdom of the imam, the wisdom of the scholars, of the teachers. You get guidance from other Muslims too. And you can see how their devotion to Allah betters uh, their life. So when we join these type of gatherings, we are in an atmosphere that's filled with love for Allah, love for the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And also these form of gatherings help to tear down the walls of division that I'm speaking about today. They help to tear down that racism and tribalism because you're around people who think like you, who believe like you, and you get to see that they come in all races, all colors and different parts of the world. So it's very important for us as Muslims to join gatherings with other people who love Allah because it'll help us to keep our Muslim identity. It'll help to remind us as to how we're all one body. And when one of us hurts, we all hurt. And we don't ignore the cries of one part of the world just over another to prefer another one over us. And what am I talking about about that? As you guys can see, when the Eid uh, prayer was announced, how many of you noticed that when different people announced that the Eid was a uh, prayer, they said, oh, and make do it for all the Muslims in the world, especially Gaza. We don't say that. Death is death. Whether it's from a bomb or from a bulldozer uh, rolling down your hut and killing the babies that's inside it, it's still death. We got to take that especially out, brothers. Just say, make do it for all the Muslims in the world. They want you to focus on Gaza so you don't see what's going on as we speak right now in Africa. They do the same genocide, okay? So when we attend gatherings with other Muslims, we listen with open hearts to the teachings and reminders that the people share and their words carry deep insight. Their words cause us to reflect on our situation and reflect on others too. Their words offer guidance and support and their words help us to grow spiritually and develop a closer, better relationship with Allah. So again, guys, it's very important for all of us as Muslims, especially those of us living in America and Europe and other non-Muslim populated countries. It's important for us to attend regular gatherings of remembrance. Like I tell you sisters on the internet, Alhamdulillah for this website. One of the reasons why I created this website back in 1986, I had moved because my job had transferred me to a different part away from my family, away from my community that I was attached to. That's what drove me to create this website so I could still be in touch with other like-minded people who believe what I believe. Never did I think it would turn into what it has become today, where there's Muslims from all over the world. We all come together to reflect to support and remind each other. So Alhamdulillah, you sisters have this website. My Zoom room is open 24 hours a day. It's open 24 hours a day for a reason, so that you sisters can always come in here and talk about your problems, get some insight, get some guidance from other Muslim women who've been in your shoes or who are in your shoes. So take advantage of this website. Take advantage of my Zoom room, okay? We're paying for it for a reason. Oh yes, it's not free. I pay $200 a month for my Zoom room and it's 24 hours. Take advantage of it. And I want you guys to remember whenever we come together in a group to learn about a law, to truly benefit, number one, your intention should be to seek Allah's love, to seek his pleasure, to seek his guidance. It shouldn't be I'm joining just to, uh, just to have somebody to talk to about nothing, okay? And when you come into these type of gatherings, you want to listen, you want to reflect about, upon the teachings that share and then apply those shared teachings into your lives, okay? And we have to always exercise caution when we're in these type of gatherings to make sure that when we do speak, 
It's about something that matters. We should only speak when it's beneficial. If it's going to contribute to personal growth, then we speak. But if it's just nonsensical stuff, we leave it out of here. And I say that about my Zoom room too. If it's nonsensical chat, we don't do here. Most of the conversations we have in our Zoom room are about personal growth or about suggestions and help and how to handle uh, our daily lives. We don't do nonsensical stuff, okay? You want to avoid harmful speech. You want to maintain an atmosphere of positivity, an atmosphere of respect and mindfulness. We don't do any arguing, no arguing, no debating. And that's the problem with these other uh, social media platforms. You got Muslims coming there to argue, to debate the religion. That's not a positive social uh, gathering. A social gathering is one that reminds you of a law and brings about positivity, not harmful negativity. Okay. And again, I want to emphasize the reason why I like uh, my website, Zoom Room. If you come into our Zoom Room, sisters, you will see that we got Muslims from all parts of Africa. I got a lot of Muslims from Africa. I got Muslims here from Germany. I got sisters here from France. We got Muslims from all over the world in our Zoom Room. South Africa, Canada, from all over. And again, this strengthens our bonds with our fellow believers. Because we all share the same thing in common. We want to get close to Allah. We're looking for paradise. Also, whenever we come together, we can connect with local Islamic centers too. Local mosque. Okay? To gain more support in our personal lives. So again, guys, it is extremely important for all of us as Muslims in maintaining our Islamic identity to connect in circles of like-minded Muslims. Subhana Allah. And again, we want to stay away. This is what one of the new Shahadas asked me. I got an email this morning from Sister Gloria. Sister Gloria sent me a beautiful email uh, saying how it was the most beautiful Ramadan ever, even though this was her first Ramadan. She said this was her first Ramadan, but it was the most beautiful Ramadan because of the learning, how she learned so much by coming to these classes. And she asked in her email, what can she do to maintain this positivity that she feels and not fall back into sin. Well, again, distance yourself from those uh, uh, environments that will take you back. Like I told Gloria, if your family is against you being Muslim, deal with them from a distance for now. If every time you go around your parents and your sisters and brothers, they're calling you names or putting down your belief system, then distance yourself from them. Call them on the telephone and check on them. Talk to them on the phone, but don't go around them. So we have to stay away from anything that's going to take us away from Allah. Also, stay away from people who commit sins. Like I told Gloria when I answered her back in her email, make sure you're careful who you choose to be your friend because the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said a person takes on the religion of their friend. None of you should have Kafir associates. Y'all understand that? I want to emphasize this to all Muslims listening to me. You should not have any non-Muslims as your personal friend. And how do I define a personal friend? A personal friend is someone that you tell your problems to. A personal friend is someone that you go to for advice. No Muslim should ever tell their personal problems, their personal business to a non-Muslim. 
and we never, ever, ever seek advice from them. Does everybody understand that? Gloria, Sandra, all the new Muslims here, do not tell or discuss your personal problems or life to non-Muslims. And don't go around thinking that a non-Muslim is intelligent either. Let me share this hadith with you. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, never refer to a non-Muslim with the title of respect because if they were worthy of that title, if they were deserving of it, they would believe la ilaha illallah. That's a powerful hadith to ponder. That's a powerful hadith to ponder. So you're going to sit there and discuss your personal problems in your marriage with a non-Muslim woman who doesn't even believe in marriage, common sense, problems in your marriage. You belong, you're in a polygamous situation, let's say. What would I look like talking about my husband and my co-wives to a non-Muslim that don't believe in co-wives? All the non-Muslim believes in is, is sex. Sex out of marriage with whoever you want to have it with. So again, guys, do not, I'm telling all new Shahadas here, do not take non-Muslims as your personal intimate friends because they will never accept you because you're a Muslim. They will never be defend you or be with you because your lifestyle is reeks the total opposite of what they believe. So how can I maintain the positivity that I had during Ramadan? Stay away from non-Muslims. Do not take them as personal, intimate friends. Stay away from people who are sinful. Do not give into your desires. You want to continue to perform your prayers every day. You want to continue to do the deeds that are pleasing to Allah. Because when we engage in sinful actions, when we are surround ourselves with sinful people, this creates a barrier between your heart and Allah's love. Everybody understand that? And this will hinder your spiritual growth. That's very important for everyone, okay? So that brings us to a question that many people may ask. Okay, Sister Layla, I'm gonna surround myself with good people. I'm gonna distance myself from non-believers, but what can I do? to avoid disobeying a law. What can I do to not give in to my desires? Well, what we talked about during Ramadan, you're gonna have to work on developing a strong sense of self-awareness. And in order to do that, you're gonna have to examine yourself. Remember I taught you guys during Ramadan, how many of you still have your checklist? You should be making your daily checklist still your daily checklist. And at the end of the night, you should still take some me time to talk to a law, to talk to a law about how your day went. Examine your actions throughout the day. Examine what your intentions were. Remember we talked about that? Ramadan has ended, but you should still continue with that. Because by examining ourselves through self-reflection, we can purify our sins. We can repent from whatever things we did that we shouldn't have done. And that strengthens our relationship with Allah. Okay. Also guys, how can you avoid falling into sin or disobeying Allah? You have to be consistent in learning this religion. You want to cling to my website. I'm here 24 hours this website, okay? Continue to seek knowledge here. Continue to ask questions here so we can better your understanding of your new way of life, okay? By studying the Quran, 
pondering its meaning by learning the hadiths, the history of them, like we're teaching you and the meanings, then this is how you avoid falling into sin. This is how you avoid disobeying a law. Remember, we fasted the month of Ramadan because Allah commanded us to do it. He commanded us to do it because it's a good way of teaching us righteousness. That righteousness is lit within your heart right now. You don't want to put it out by stopping the good behavior that you've done these past three weeks, three to four weeks. Okay. So these are some powerful factors that will help us to maintain that closeness with the law and will also help us to develop a genuine love for a law. And we need to implement this in our lives. You want to continue to seek knowledge of this religion. You want to continue to be consistent in your actions of worship. You want to work on developing humility within yourself. Do a lot of self-reflection at night so you can purify whatever mistakes you made. And always, always seek uh, Allah's help and Allah's guidance. Everybody understand that? Okay, so now let's see how well you understood it. I'm going to give you a quiz. Yep. Everybody get ready. First question. Wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> okay. What are some examples of gatherings of people who love a law? Give me some examples of the type of gatherings that we should go to that are gatherings of people who love a law. Give me an example. What are gatherings of lovers of a law? Give me an example of what a gathering is. What such a gathering is. Anyone? One gathering that um is, you know, talking about a law, sometimes um explaining, you know, understanding the theme, Quran study, um, just basically talking about the theme in general. So Quran um, studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, good job. That's an example. Attending Quranic classes, Quran classes. Good job. So the Fatima, mashallah, Fatima said Islamic classes where you come together to remember Allah, such as here at this website, all of my classes. These are examples of gatherings that people who love Allah attend. What's some more examples? Juma. Exactly, going to the Juma prayer. See, the children know. The children know. You brothers, y'all need to attend Juma prayer because the Imam always gives good words of advice and good guidance to you. Plus, you're with other brothers like yourself who are struggling to earn Allah's love like you. Good job. Any other examples of gatherings of the people who love Allah? Islamic classes, the Quran. You join, your, join your Muslim family and remember the law and helping them, you know, help educate them about the religion. Now you can tell Sister Latifah is a, a teacher. Exactly. And that's something that Sister Latifah likes to do. For those of you who don't know, Latifah's my best friend. She loves to cook dinner and invite all her children and her grandchildren and her great grandchildren over to the house to eat. And Latifah takes advantage of this by giving them dawah, reminding them of why they were created, reminding them of what their purpose is. And she'll speak about is Islam to them. This is excellent. That's a gathering, a family gathering of the lovers of Allah. Any other examples? Good job. Oh, one more. Um, when the Muslim brother, like if there's like a food pantry, others can see that they're good works as far as giving out and helping out and giving food out. Um, people look at this. Yeah, it's an example of how we should be working together for the greater good. Exactly. And that's something that even old lady Sabrine does. MashaAllah, Sister Sabrine, she participates in the food pantry. Oh, yeah. She gets away there. 
You know, you're, it's a good way of also giving dawah, of giving dawah not only to the other Muslims, but to the non-Muslims too. Subhana Allah. Good job. Good answers, guys. I'm proud of you all on that. Okay, let's look at the second question. Question number two. What makes these gatherings keep you connected to Allah? What makes these type of gatherings keep you connected to Allah? These gatherings keep us connected to Allah because we're reminded, we be, we're reminded um, of Allah's love, number one. And number two, we have to also remember that in these gatherings, the angels are you know, looking at what we're doing. So that's a consistent reminder for us. MashaAllah, Geechee's on the boat and on the road today. Good job, Geechee. <laughs> Anyone else want to ask? She basically covered it. Yep, and also it's it gives you a spiritual atmosphere. You know, hopefully it will uplift your family and friends and also inspire them to stay on the path of Allah. MashaAllah, y'all hearing my students today? They had a good Ramadan. Exactly. Also, Fatima, she said, it's the sharing of Islamic information from all people from all over the world striving for the same thing. Exactly. It'll break down that racism that we're suffering with. You're going to tell Muslims in Africa to eat mud. But you got all the pity, and I mean pity, which don't nobody need your pity. You got pity for the, the Arabs. It'll, it'll knock down those walls of division if we attended such gatherings more often. Subhana Allah, good job. Let's look at the last question. Who can give some examples of actions that may take us away from Allah? What type of actions distance us from Allah? Watching too much TV and playing the game. MashaAllah, the kids know because they know what it does to them. Watching TV. Too much vampire diaries. Oh, yeah. Y'all know Layla Nasheba loves the vampire diaries. I fall asleep on it now, though. But, yeah, watching too much TV. Too much TV will take you away from Allah, guys. Uh, oh, wrong camera. Too much TV will take you away from Allah, and too much TV will also uh, uh, playing those uh, uh, those games will will also distance you from Allah. Good job.